We're all familiar with the slow-living, tree-dwelling sloths of today, but this group of animals used to be much more varied. You may well have heard of the giant ground sloth Megatherium, which grew to the size of an elephant. But did you know that before these came along, there was another genus that was aquatic? Inhabiting the south coast of Peru during the late Miocene and much of the Pliocene, the Thalassocnus sloths could be found swimming lazily along the seafloor, grazing on sea grasses in the shallows, and using their claws to anchor themselves against powerful waves. Like whales, seals and manatees before them, this group of mammals had decided that life on land wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and began a gradual return to the ocean. Their marine migration is documented beautifully in the fossil record. The five known species of Phallosocnus are considered chronospecies, rather than multiple related animals that could have overlapped or coexisted with one another, they may represent a single lineage transforming over time. As Thalassocnus develops from the T. antiquus species of 8 million years ago to the T. eucensis species of 3 million years ago, it slowly specializes for a marine niche. The creatures transform from terrestrial browsers, eating shoots and leaves like many other sloths, to aquatic grazers surviving off sea grasses. This can be seen by looking at the bones at the end of the jaw. In browsers, these premaxilla bones form a point, the jaw designed to selectively pluck particular plants or leaves. In grazers, they're wide and rectangular, for indiscriminately taking in large mouthfuls. All Thalassocnus fossils have squarer premaxillae than other sloths, and they continue to develop in that direction, with the snout also growing longer. The wide tips of the upper and lower jaw bones of later Thalassocnus indicate that they had large, powerful lips for uprooting plants, and these species may have even developed a keratinized horny pad like a manatee's to help grip grass. These sloths were likely driven to the oceans as they sought new food sources, thanks to worsening conditions. The coastline of Peru and Chile is the driest place on Earth, with some areas that haven't seen rainfall for the entirety of human history. It wasn't always a barren desert, however, but became more and more arid from 14 to 3 million years ago, right as Thalassocnus was evolving. The three older species of Thalassocnus, Antiquus, Natans, and Littoralis, have grooves on their teeth from ingesting sand, but the two younger species don't have these marks. This suggests that while the older species were grazing in the shallows, kicking up big clouds of sand as they moved, or even just munching seaweed that washed up on the shore, the newer animals were swimming to deeper waters. None of these creatures have many obvious adaptations for swimming, however, so they were probably very slow moving. They were sloths, after all. Though that said, even modern sloths can be surprisingly athletic in the water. Compared to their close relatives, the North American Nothrotheriops, Thalassocnus did have a longer tail, and it was flattened like a beaver's or platypus's. Just like these animals, they may have used their tails to maintain their balance in the water, or to help when diving. Thalassocnus also developed one other feature useful for an aquatic mammal, incredibly dense bones. While T. antiquus had the regular bones of a landlubber, over millions of years these thickened, and the internal cavities filled with bone marrow all but disappeared, especially in the limbs of later species. Like a ship's ballast, this would have helped the sea sloths stay upright in the water, as well as counteracting the air pockets of the lungs to achieve negative buoyancy. Today, only manatees have bones as dense as Thalassocnus, and only platypuses have limbs with a similar degree of compactness. Both are animals that spend long periods feeding on sea or river beds. In fact, Thalassocnus had such heavy bones that they were probably able to simply walk along the ocean floor. The sharp-clawed, dexterous hands of sloths are unique compared to other mammals that have made the transition from land to sea, so it's interesting to consider how they might have used them. They likely helped the sloths dig up seagrass rhizomes and may have served as miniature anchors, providing stability while feeding during strong waves. They may also have been handy while clinging to or clambering up rocks. Marine iguanas have longer claws than their land-dwelling relatives, for exactly this sort of rock climbing. We do have evidence that Thalassox was very dependent on its forelimbs. Some remains have been found with signs that a back leg had broken and then healed, perhaps as the animals were thrown against rocks or cliffs. With their clawed front limbs still functional, they may have been able to pull themselves to safety, but there are no remains with similar arm breaks, which suggests damaging an arm meant almost certain death. As well as the elements, other dangers for Thalassocnus likely came from the predators that roamed the Miocene waters off the Peruvian coast. These include numerous sharks, crocodiles, and predatory whales like the macroreptorial Acrophyceta. Though we don't have any specific evidence of predation, the sloth's large size and slow movements would surely have made them attractive targets. Unless they were somehow fighting off sharks with their claws, Thalassocnus's best form of defense would probably have been moving to shallow waters, where many predators couldn't reach them. 
but that wouldn't have been much help if seals like Hadrochirus also decided to have a nibble. The five known Thalassocnus species are similar in size to the land-based Nophrotherids in the same family. The early Pliocene T. littoralis is the smallest at 2.1 metres, and the youngest species T. yorkensis is the largest at 3.1 metres. However, a wide variety of sizes in the fossils of individual species has led scientists to suggest Thalassocnus could have exhibited sexual dimorphism, with the males being significantly larger than the females. This is often a trait associated with polygyny, particularly when males compete fiercely for harems of females. Other differences include larger premaxillae in males, which suggests that they could have had an expanded upper lip or proboscis like an elephant seal, a species that's famous for having an enormous size difference between the sexes. Perhaps this had an equivalent use in Thalassocnus, to intimidate rivals and make loud, bellowing cries. When Thalassocnus was first discovered, it was found only in the Pisco Formation of Peru, and thought to be endemic to a pretty small area. But then, in 2002, a Thalassocnus fossil showed up in northern Chile, 1,600 kilometers away from the others. Since then, it's been established from fragmentary remains that most Thalassocnus species occupied the coasts of both Peru and Chile. Though for decades all Thalassocnus fossils were found in coastal formations alongside sharks, fish and whales, in the 2020s some remains were unearthed in continental Argentina, nowhere near to the sea, showing that not all Thalassocnus were strictly marine animals. It could mean that the animals dispersed as desertification took place, with some driven inland and others to the sea, or perhaps the genus simply covered a much larger area than scientists originally thought. In their gradual adaptation for the ocean, Thalassocnus mirrors the early stages of other mammal groups like the cetaceans, which began as wolf-like creatures and slowly developed the body plans they have today. It's wrong to suggest an animal is evolving towards any end goal, that's not how natural selection works. But given how these sloths progressed in an increasingly nautical direction, it's hard not to imagine what they might look like if they had survived to this day. Could the marine sloths have lost their fur to become more streamlined and develop more aquatic traits like a paddle-like tail? Would they have ever given up on coming to land altogether and, freed from many of the constraints of gravity, grown to enormous sizes? Instead of the whales, which are all predators, it's actually manatees that provide the best modern comparison for Thalassocnus. They have the same herbivorous seagrass diet, similar bottom-feeding behaviour, and by the time of T. Yorkensis, already shared many of the same adaptations. Given another 10 million years, would convergent evolution have seen these sloths grow to resemble manatees more than their terrestrial cousins? Sadly, it was not to be. About 2 million years ago, Central America joined up with South America in Panama. This closed off the Central American seaway, cutting off warm ocean currents from the Caribbean. The resulting drop in temperature would have devastated the seagrass that was the Thalassocles' main food source. Even if the plants could withstand the cold, the animals themselves may have struggled to survive in the colder waters without developing a layer of blubber, which would then have made them more buoyant and interfered with their feeding methods on the ocean floor. Unable to adapt to the quickly changing conditions, the sea sloths went extinct. The name Thalassocles comes from the Greek phalassa, meaning ocean, and ochnus, a mythological character representing hesitation, or the wasting of time. Perhaps Thalassocnus was just wasting its time in the ocean, progressing down a path that would ultimately lead to a dead end. But nothing lasts forever. If we're all just whiling away time until our eventual extinction, I could think of worse ways to spend it than splashing about in a subtropical sea. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider becoming a subscriber so you'll see more like it in the future.